I'm going to remove some hoses in this episode and then not replace them. Lucky you. And this happens. Alan's cooling system is in need of a sprucing up before heading to sea. Why? Firstly, the hoses are old. I also need to check the anode and that demands that I drain the coolant. Plus I want to enhance the survivability of the whole system too. I measured all the hose external diameters before removal as I had this dreamlike ambition of efficiency that would see the new hoses able to go on moments after the old ones came off. Soon I realized the gauges and specs from Alan's original outfitting were a hodgepodge of types so there would be no way to make sure that I was ordering the right ones. Some had thicker walls than others. We have to head outside briefly. Back in the day, plan number one was to remove this keel cooler and install a new one inside a protected conduit. Like all rubbish plan number ones, that's shelved, and instead I'm making a reinforced shield for it this coming winter. Part of that decision necessitated a check that this is a tough copper nickel cooler and not a softer, cheaper copper. Sanding back through the protective oxidation layer reveals a silvery colour, and so a thumbs up on that count. The burr surface will return to normal after a few months. We need to gravity drain the cooling system. There are two bolts, and neither are at the absolute lowest point of the coolers, but it's my only option. Unless I had Alan lifted and tilted back. I lack the budget for such tomfoolery, and so I implore the few of you who haven't to join Alan's army and or get Alan's shirts, stickers and hats. The cooling system is not detailed in the engine's handbook, so some of this will be guesswork. Anyhow, I unscrewed the bolts. I won't lie, I wasn't overwhelmed at the resulting torrent. You are now observing what I'm confident will come to be known as the Big Drip. There's at least a couple of gallons of water in the system, so this may take a while. At least the water and coolant appears pretty clear, and not like the runoff from a mud heap. But, with some fiddling upstairs, Alan's stage fright ceased flow at last. I knew there must be some water trapped in the many twists and turns of the cooling system, but we got half a bucket out. I could start the disassembly in the engine bay. I thought I'd start on the easier port side. This is a simple bypass with a preheater mounted on an arm. This is so if the engine is started with a lifeboat suspended on davits out of the water in a cold winter, and so the coolant fluid well below zero degrees centigrade, it doesn't zoom into the engine and upset it. We don't need this, as Alan will always start up when in the water, which is of course warmer than cold winter air. The assembly is bulky and in the way too. Plus, the heater is 42 volts AC, and we don't do 42 volts AC on board Alan. The hoses start to come off, and the first does not bode well. Really well stuck on, and I decided to go for the famed slice, cut and chisel technique to get it off. The other end was a little easier, but I had a sixth sense we'd meet a pocket of trapped coolant fluid, and we did. The rest of the clips and bolts weren't too much of a calamity, and the arm came off. I cleaned the heater up and stuck it on eBay. New book ones retail for thousands of euros, quite why I don't know, but we'll see how we do. There was also a now freed bolt that held the heater's arm onto the engine, and I think it actually holds the engine together too. So I cleaned it up, I popped it back on again with a Nordlock washer, a good tightening with a ratchet, and a dollop of red paint. There's also a slight chance that this brief excursion for the coolant out of and back into the engine is parallel to another internal path, and so I could merely plug both ends, but I can't take that risk if mistaken, and block the circulation. The other side of the engine is rather more complex, and so I don't get confused once it's all free, my labelling escapades are evident to all. The smaller hoses came off without too much drama, although now they've stiffened, it can be a little like doing a 10 point turn in a car. Forward, backward, forward, backward, forward, backward. The widest hose with the reducer came off between the strainer and another inlet, and then of course to where the coolant heads to the through holes and also in and out of the gearbox. You can see two of the hoses have been in contact and chafing badly, so this needs attention. It'll be no surprise to anyone, but literally the final jubilee clip I came to was kaput. Dead. Rusted. Seized. Suboptimally operational. Naturally, and never one to overreact, we've gone for the grinder, which is what it was born to do. You can see the extent of the hose chafing here. Not the best installation if we're to be brutally honest. 
and documenting the demise of said Jubilee clip. There's a top loop that goes from the other side of the gearbox to a through hole, and with that you can survey the carnage. Lots of clips to salvage though, so that's something. There's also this copper pipe that runs from a rubber attachment at the front, back and to the chafed hose leading to the gearbox. It's not ideal, perhaps in need of support, and Alan's creators roughly gouged a corner of fiberglass to bodge out some room for it back in the day. That's pretty much the disassembly and general sorting out completed, and I'll show you the reassembly, enhancements and general neatening up in due course, but first there was another job to tick off. There are some large, painted over bolt heads on the starboard side of Alan's engine. Let's see what sort of state the engine's anode is in. It could be completely gone, or it could be literally as new. No idea at all. I became increasingly certain I didn't want to unbolt the engine, have it fall in half in front of me, so it was worth double checking that I was aiming for the anode bolt. Once out, and hopefully not releasing another torrent of coolant, I hope to see how Alan's engine's internal corrosion has fared. First attempts were fruitless, and I remembered the last time a spanner and I took on this side of the engine, back in the starter motor swap out days, I ended up with bloody knuckles. So that wouldn't work. A socket was sent for, and that did the trick. The moment I'd waited so long for, about eight and a half minutes in fact. Was the anode corroded away, leaving the steel block to be eaten away at? It was with a quick wipe clean, practically as new, still cylindrical and unpitted. Great news, well done Alan. I decided to leave the original in place and keep the replacement as a spare. Putting the anode back in couldn't be a slapdash affair though. Without a good seal, it might leak and I'll have created a new headache. The copper washer wasn't a crush washer and it was flawless, so I kept it and instead just cleaned the threads, checked for dried flakes of paint and applied a bead of Hylomar sealing paste. Back in, tight, painted and done. Next time we'll deal with some smart looking valves put everything back together, and I'll decide not to get one of these. That's not quite it though. I've also been, aside from all the secondary glazing work on the windows, coming up with a blackout system, so either artificial lights or midnight sun doesn't permanently illuminate those trying to rest or sleep inside Allen. My first idea was this set of magnetic strips and a special blackout fabric, but it's so thin and wavy that it's tricky to get a good tension on, and so fitting and avoiding light leakage is a nightmare. I have one solution in mind, but in the meantime, do you? Bye.